Good morning. Please stand as you are able and read responsibly this morning's call to worship. Into our fears and through our locked doors, come, almighty God. When we think peace be with you means no change or disruption in our lives, come, Lord Jesus. Amidst our lives that confuse religious entertainment with Easter transformation, come, Holy Spirit. For the sake of a community meant to open eyes, minds, and hearts to you in the real world, come, mysterious, loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our opening hymn is 246, Christ is Alive. Please be seated. Christ is alive is a faith claim, a bold statement, which gives us courage to be ourselves in his presence, his living presence. Let us come before God in honest prayer as we prepare to enter into this worship experience together. Please join me in the unison prayer of preparation and confession which is printed in your bulletin and goes on on the first page at the bottom and goes on to the second page. Let's pray together. O oh Lord our God, forgive us today for losing our bearings whenever we are not in control. Forgive us for not expecting the risen Christ to show up behind our locked doors. Forgive us for thinking that church mainly happens inside these walls and not into the world you so love and into which we are sent. Forgive us for looking for your power in all the conventional places, but never in our places of brokenness, crisis, and defeat. 
Forgive us for convincing ourselves again and again, and despite the evidence of our lives, that we don't need you. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, repair what we are, and by the power of Christ's resurrection, raise us up to live full lives and to serve others in your name. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we'll continue now with silent prayer. Staying seated and in the spirit of prayer, we'll sing together prayer hymn 243, Be Not Afraid. This may shock you, but um, I'm kind of an introvert when I'm not on, and I can be quiet at times. And one time I was uh, with a new friend with some old friends, and the new friend was frustrated that I was being so quiet while we were all together, and when, uh, they didn't think I heard and said, why is he being like that? And the old friend said, because here he can. He doesn't have to talk. He can just be himself. That's the feeling of assurance that we have from God's love because Christ is alive. You can be yourself. You have friends, you have family members, people who just, you don't have to work around them. You're accepted as you are. I hope that as your, that is the message today and I hope that is your experience and feeling as we say these words of assurance. Friends, if you are in Christ, your past is finished and gone. Everything is fresh and new like the first light of Easter morning. So trust and believe that good news. You are so loved by God that you are embraced and welcomed just as you are right now, and you are forgiven. Amen. If you're able, let's stand and celebrate that gift. second Sunday in the season of Easter. Uh, last week, there were 
throngs of people here. I mean throngs. They were, they were thronging. Uh, both services were incredibly well attended. The second service at 11 a.m., we really almost ran out of seats, and that includes up in the balcony. So I was thrilled, and I really give those people a lot of credit, but you, I give even more credit, <laughs> because you are hardcore worshipers. It is spring break, and people have sprung, but not you. And so I am grateful to be here in the sanctuary with you, worshiping in this season of Easter, because Christ is alive. So we shall not be afraid, and we're worshiping together with folks online today, uh, maybe some spring break travelers and others, even across the country. We have people who, worshiping, who worship with us from the West Coast. Uh, so welcome to everyone, virtually and in person. If you are in the sanctuary and if you're in a pew sitting near the aisle, if you could grab that black booklet, uh, it's our Ritual of Friendship pad. If you are sharing a pew today with someone else, after you fill it out, if you pass it to the sides and then back to its starting place. Take a look at the green insert today with all kinds of wonderful information by way of invitation to you to be part of the life of this good church. Um, there's so much going on here, including in two weeks, the much beloved tradition of PCUM's Got Talent. At 3 p.m., mark your calendar, uh, reach out to Henry Giuliano through the church to uh, plan to share your talent. There is a lot of talent here. I invite everyone to come, especially if you've never been to one of these PCUM Got Talent uh, experiences before, PCUM's Got Talent experiences before, because it is amazing. It's also a fundraiser uh, to continue to augment uh, our amazing music program, which was on display and led us in worship so wonderfully last Sunday, and it will do again today. Uh, so plan, if you will, to uh, block out that afternoon of Sunday the 21st of April. It's a big weekend here in the church. Uh, the wonderful way to conclude that busy, wonderful weekend is to be here for PCUM's Got Talent. If you have a toddler or more than one, be part of our toddler survival group. I love that name. There is a new spring uh, membership exploration class coming together. If you'd like to be part of that, you can follow the uh, suggested instructions there and all kinds of other things happening in the life of the church, including uh, sign-up possibilities to serve neighbors in need. We do it once a month, actually twice a month, once a month in two different local uh, venues, one here in Montclair and one in Newark. We serve hungry and homeless neighbors in need, people who are food insecure. It's a great way to love others as we have been loved and also to make new connections and deepen relationships. Uh, so sign up for that if you would. And then uh, Denise and I are very proud of ourselves. Denise, who not only is a soprano and a liturgist extraordinaire, also is our office administrator. And I think next year will be 40 years with the church. Is that right? Yeah. She started when she was an infant. Talk about toddler survival. Uh, so anyway, we're very proud of the fact that uh, that uh, we put these new signs up there on the, in the breezeway in the deacon's corner to sign up to help our deacons any Sunday of the year host coffee hour. Hospitality, as we'll talk about today especially, is really an important part of the Christian life. Please take a look at that sign-up sheet out there to help with coffee hour. Instructions and partners will be provided and incredible amounts of fun. And also you can sign up to dedicate flowers on any Sunday of the year or more than one to honor and memorialize loved ones, important people in your lives. Those signs are clear now. Uh, the, there's no way you can miss them, and we look forward to you signing up and, uh, and to us signing up and all of us signing up together. Last week, we had, I think, a total of 80 children here in the church. I'm not sure we'll have exactly 80 today, but... Uh, those of the kids who are here, I'd like to invite you up to the front now to join me on the steps. Perfect timing back there. Come on up. everybody. How you doing? Right? 
I, uh, oh, I forgot something here, yeah. Okay, everybody close your eyes. Are they closed? Really? Okay. Okay, you can open them. So, you guys, uh, you guys seen Pastor Greg? You haven't seen him? Handsome guy, a little pudgy, maybe. You seen where? What's that? You just saw him, right? Yeah, where is he? That's a good question. He's supposed to be here, right? We're paying this guy, right? Well, if you see him. Tell him I'm looking for him. Do you guys know my name? All right. You're, I'm about, about to give you the shock of your lives. You ready? It's me. You didn't. Did you? You didn't know that? You did know, right? Okay. Not the best in disguise. My mustache doesn't really grow this way. And it's no longer purple, it's kind of white. In fact, I don't wear it anymore because I'm looking more and more like Santa Claus every year. So, um, this, what do you call what I've got on right now that I, I was trying to hide? Jesus was disguised. It was Easter Day. What day of the week is Easter, by the way? Sunday. Sunday, yeah, Sunday. Excellent, this is a very smart group. But it was later in the day, and there were two disciples, not, not part of the 11 who were as close as followers who were so sad, but there are other followers of Jesus too. And these two guys, they didn't know about the tomb being empty. They didn't hear about Easter, and so they were very sad. I'm going to take this off while I'm talking. I'll put it back on at the appropriate dramatic moment, okay? Um, they're walking along, and they're all sad. Can you all stand up for me? And just right there, just pretend like you're walking. Can you do that? High knees. Let's go. All right. Now, can you look sad while you're doing it? This is what's going on. They're very bummed out, these guys. And all of a sudden, somebody they didn't recognize started walking with them. Keep walking. This is a long walk we've got. This is, we're not there yet. We're going seven miles, by the way. We're getting, we're getting our steps in. And... They looked sad, and so the stranger goes, what's going on, guys? Why do you look so sad? And they said, Jesus died. Jesus died. died. That's right. Their friend. They loved him. They had so many hopes for him. Keep walking. We're not done. Right? And so, in fact, they said, are you the only one in the whole town whose phone isn't on? You don't know what's going on? And he goes, I don't know. And so they told him about how sad they were because Jesus died. And then Jesus told them their own story. This strange guy with a purple mustache, or whatever this guy was, he told them about how all the way through the Bible, God had predicted that he would send himself, his own self into our world out of love to take take care of us and to love us. Are you walking? Everybody? Okay. I'm getting tired. I'm breathing heavy. Okay, let's go. And they listened to him, and then when they got to their village where they lived, they said, okay, you can stop. They said, hey, come eat with us. We've got some food here. And he goes, oh, no, no, I couldn't. I couldn't impose. They go, no, 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 please stay, because they like talking to this strange guy. And then, just like we're going to do a little bit later in church, Jesus, who was their guest, took a loaf of bread, and he broke it so they could all eat it together. And guess what happened when he broke it? They recognized him. He was alive. They thought he was dead, but he was alive. Because the power of God's love is so strong and so big, the power of God's love for you and even for me and for the whole world is so strong, there he was. They recognized him, and then, poof, he was gone. And they said to each other, look at each other and go, well, go ahead, just let go. Whoa, they said, Didn't our hearts burn inside of us while he was talking to us on the road? That was Jesus. And they were so happy because they knew he was alive. 
So that's it. Even when you're sad, keep your eyes open and your ears open because the person you're talking to, especially if you extend hospitality to them, if you're kind to them, if you go out of their way to help somebody else, there's a very good chance you're going to meet Jesus, okay? And he's going to remind you again how much he loves you. Can you do a repeat after me prayer together? Let's go. Dear God, thank you for disguises and for revealing yourself to us. We love you. Amen. Thank you kids very much. You go out for Sunday school. Good job. Ravon really loves that song. <laughs> this morning's first scripture reading is from the book of Psalms. We'll read together responsively Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For those of us of a certain vintage, it's hard to say that psalm in modern language, isn't it? Our second reading today is a very famous story that occurs only in the Gospel of Luke. It's uh, what we call a what, post-resurrection narrative. It's the story of the road to Emmaus, which the kids and I just attempted to act out. Um, it's unique and has what we call Lucan themes uh, running through it, themes of healing and of secrecy and discovery uh, and of hope. Listen now for what the Spirit is saying to you this morning and to the church. In Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35, the story of the road to Emmaus. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? He asked them, What things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They came they, they were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. 
As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then these two told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. May the meditations of our hearts together this day be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, after a busy, busy weekend last weekend, it's been a quiet week around here uh, with the resurrection and the resurrection celebrations in our rearview mirror but hopefully not the resurrected Christ. Sarah, my spouse, who grew up in the nicer parts of Boston, and that's an understatement, uh, left uh, early this week, on Monday actually, for a conference in, of all places, Spokane, Washington, America's biggest little city, where my parents lived and where I lived for my high school years, three years, and Sarah's hotel at this conference and where she stayed, the Davenport Hotel, where presidents and movie stars would always stay when they were in Spokane, where her conference was, is also the hotel where I had my senior prom. <laughs> By the way, the Davenport Hotel in Spokane, just in case you don't know this, which was built in, uh, in the early part of the 20th century and opened in 1914, the same year World War I began, was the first hotel in the United States with air conditioning, with a pipe organ, with a central vacuuming system, with housekeeping carts, and with accordion ballroom doors. That's right. That's right, New York City. Sarah texted me when she got there, this hotel is really grand. And I said, you sound a little too surprised. So anyway, while she's been gone, it's been up to me to do the early morning dog walk. Not, my normal, not in my normal job description, the early morning anything. Uh, so to wake myself up this entire week, Percy and I have visited my favorite tree in Montclair. It's the best tree. It's a sprawling oak on Hawthorne Avenue, not far from my house, between Orange and Gates Avenues, and I love that tree, these giant branches that not only go up, but they go out. Some of them are so low, you can reach up and touch them. It's, it's incredible. How, I don't know how old the tree is. It's got to be old. There's a tree like that on Holly Avenue in Milford, Connecticut, an 80-foot tall maple. But this tree lost a limb back in 1985 when Hurricane Gloria blew through. And other than that missing branch, that tree on Holly Avenue has always been there and always looked pretty much the same for as long as anybody can remember. But that spot where the limb broke off caused quite a stir at one point in the trees in the town's history. A Milford resident, Claudia Voigt, looked at the stump area one day where the branch broke off and saw what to her looked like the face of Jesus. It took my breath away, she reported. I told my friend to come over, and pretty soon, the whole neighborhood was there at that tree. Word spread, and before anyone realized it, the maple tree in Milford, Connecticut, became a popular attraction as car after car drove by to see the face of Christ on that tree. Drivers slowed down as they passed by. They're, they're sort of, you know, it's kind of like that house in Clifton with all the Christmas and Halloween decorations where it gets very kind of dangerous because everybody's kind of looking and um, everybody wanted to see firsthand this strange apparition, the face 
of Christ. People were parking all around the neighborhood, walking through people's yards. It got kind of crazy. Claudia, who made the discovery, describes herself as someone who attends church now and then, but is not overly religious, whatever that means. And she said it to a reporter kind of to reassure him that she's not crazy. I'm not reading the Bible all the time or anything like that, she said. But for Claudia and for other people, apparently, the tree with its purported image of Christ was a kind of a sign. And she said, I just think people may be able to take some hope from it. Another resident, Kathy Cornwall, said she brought her three children over to see the tree because we have a lot of single mothers in the neighborhood and teenagers who have to make tough decisions in this, these difficult times. So uh, it's like a message to have faith in ourselves and to have hope for the world, this tree. Which brings us to our question for the day in the sermon title on this first Sunday after Easter, where in the world do we find Jesus? In Milford, Connecticut? I mean, that's where Congregationalists are. There aren't many Presbyterians there. How can Jesus be up there? Do you remember that game show for kids with middle school contestants called Where in the World is Carmen San Diego? That was a great show. With the actor Lynn Thigpen, who was uh, in the original Godspell movie uh, and also on Sesame Street. Uh, Lynn Thigpen was awesome. Where in the world is Carmen S San Diego? Like a detective game show, and, and the detective and the criminals would be all over the planet, and you would learn geography through this game show. Well, where in the world do we find Jesus? Do we find Jesus Christ? That's the question, of course, that has been asked for generations. But another way of framing it is, if indeed God is victorious over the tomb, and the tomb is empty, and Christ is alive, where do we find the living God? The residents of Milford, Connecticut say, in that maple tree. But where do we find the living Christ, this power of love and life which is undefeatable in times of trouble and uncertainty and heartache and sadness, of illness, of relationship stress. People have reported seeing Christ's face down through the centuries in all kinds of places. I did a little more recent research. Um, and most recently, people have reported seeing Jesus' face in dripping paint, in wet plaster. And there, were, by the way, there were photos of this each time online, and it kind of looked like him in most of them. Uh, one place they saw his face in a Walmart receipt. The other one, even better than that, is in the creases of a drying sock. In a cheese pizza, I don't know why, just cheese, I guess no, no toppings. And my favorite one of all time, of course, still is the people seeing Jesus' face in their pancakes for breakfast. People are looking, but where do they find him? And if you do find Jesus, how can you be sure it's not just wishful thinking? That Jesus is really with us, even when everything else seems to be pointing in the other direction, pointing towards sadness and destruction and stress and death. Well, last weekend, now and 2,000 years ago, was quite a weekend for the followers of Jesus. It seemed for them in that first Easter weekend that everything had gone wrong. It seemed like the bottom had fallen out. All their hopes and dreams vanished when Jesus got arrested. And then things got worse from there. With him ending up being executed on a cross, made an example of by the authorities with this terrible way of dying, which was used to intimidate other people, to keep other people, especially occupied people, in line. They were in a state of shock, a state of fear. Everything had happened so fast, and then early on that Sunday morning, some women in their group had reported that the tomb was empty, and the men at first dismissed those reports, but a few of them eventually ran to the tomb, and they found it to be true. It was empty, which brings us to Luke's story today in the 24th chapter of his gospel. Later that day, two Jesus followers, there were more than just 11, there were it was sort of a kind of a community, included women and men, many of whose names we do not know. 
But these two were Cleopas and some other guy who doesn't get a name in this story. And they were walking home, I guess, from the big city down the hill. If you've been there, you know Jerusalem is a city on a hill, literally and figuratively. And they're walking seven miles to a small village of Emmaus where they lived. The walk was going to take over two hours. It probably seemed longer to these guys, though. It is March Madness, you know, the NCAA basketball tournament. Have you ever heard an announcer say, after a team loses at the last second, that's going to be a long flight home? It's not longer. It doesn't take any longer. It just seems longer because they're so sad. When you're sad, everything seems like it takes a long time. The world kind of sort of moves like you're in molasses or in deep quicksand. These two guys were hurting. So they do have a long walk ahead of them. And that's what Luke tells us, and that's what we need to understand and absorb if we're going to get what God wants us to get out of this Bible reading today, out of Luke chapter 24, out of the road to Emmaus story. We've got to stop and pause long enough to get the emotions of this setup here. These guys are devastated. They are terribly sad. And on their sad walk, they fall in step with the stranger who's walking along too, of course, the narrator tells us the ironic truth. This was actually the risen Jesus, but they don't know it. They don't recognize him. Who would? Who would? As they're walking, you ask what they're talking about. They say, are you the only person who, like, where, what do you have, blinders? Are you deaf? That's been all the news. Jesus, in whom we had so many hopes, a prophet mighty in word and deed, a kind, wonderful person, He's dead. We had, we had expected and hoped so many things for him. And of course, in their discouragement, and this is what Luke wants us to know, they are blinded to the risen Lord who's standing right next to them. And that happens to all of us a lot of the time. We can be so down or so focused on our own problems or so caught up in everything we're doing so frantically to keep problems at a distance that we forget that finding Christ really isn't that hard. And what's wonderful about this story, this unique story in Luke, is that once Easter is over, you don't really have to look in old tree stumps or in your pancakes or your socks to find him if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. So where in the world do we find the risen Christ now that Easter has passed? Well, I think this story gives us three answers. The first is that we find him in the story. It's not just the Easter story, but then again, yes, it is. It's the story we tell here every Sunday of the year. We tell it, and we retell it, and when we get done retelling it, guess what we do? We tell it again. That's all we do here. We just go over the same story, over and over and over. So maybe one day we'll get it. Isn't that a principle of advertising? You know, a million times, oh, I think I need a vacuum cleaner. It's been there the whole time. Familiarity can really dull our senses. So we keep telling it. We tell our children. We tell our children's children as we have been called to do. Have you ever had a Sunday school teacher or maybe a preacher, not necessarily now, who made the Bible come alive for you in ways you never had realized before, though you've been looking at that story and reading it for your whole life? Did you ever go to church or open scripture and all of a sudden, even if you've been familiar with that story and read it a million times, that day it seemed like that story was written for you, just for you. God is in the story. God is in the story that was told, written, 66 books in a Bible, right? Our Bible, one book, has 66 books in it, 39 in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, same thing. 27 books in the New Testament. We tell the story over and over again because it is a human story, written by a bunch of humans just like us who were not perfect, we believe somehow inspired by the Spirit as they told the story and tried to relate something of it in different ways to future generations. It is our story. It's the first place we meet the risen Christ. 
you know that the stranger on the road, he told them their story. Their, their story. Back in those days, Scripture meant the Hebrew Bible, their scriptural tradition, our Old Testament. Jesus, as they were walking, opened up for these two sad disciples of Jesus who didn't recognize him, that story. And later they realized, didn't our hearts burn within us on the road as he was telling us the story of our own scripture, tr scriptural tradition? What makes your hearts, I'm not going to use burn because people think about heartburn. What makes your heart light? What moves you to tears? Whatever it is, don't be afraid. Keep doing that. Find it in the story. A man named Dan Wakefield made that kind of discovery. He grew up going to Sunday school and church when his parents made him, but then like a lot of us do, like I did in his early 20s and late teens, he left the church, was away for it for many years, until for some reason on vacation he took a trip to the Holy Land. And all of a sudden, there Dan Wakefield of Indianapolis, Indiana was, standing on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus grew up and met people and invited people to follow him into a different way of living. And the name Galilee brought back to Dan images and memories of his time as a child in church. But there he was now in a place where people really did walk and fish and live. And all of a sudden, for him, as it happens for some people, it did for me when I visited the Holy Land a couple of times, the story all of a sudden jumped off the page and became much more real. Tell the story over and over again. Engage with the story. Try to figure out ways to engage with it to kind of break us yourself out of the familiarity, which can really kind of dull our senses, as I say, and have us miss so many things. The disciples are hurt. They are told the story again and again. And even though they have no idea at that moment what's going on, they're going to remember that moment for the rest of their lives. And they're just walking and talking and being sad, what people do sometimes. They're just living. And still, they meet the risen Christ because he finds them in their own story. And suddenly, accidentally, they, they meet God. Or was it an accident? In fact, something else happened that day. The second place they met the risen Christ is in their memories, like Dan did, like Dan Wakefield of Indianapolis, Indiana. Cleopas and his unnamed companion had heard Jesus talk and teach many times, and in their sadness and grief and disillusionment, disillusionment with him dying, and with their plans for him and for themselves all of a sudden being dashed against the rocks of not working out, these two disciples had forgotten what Jesus had already taught them and said to them about the necessity of him being abandoned and suffering and even dying. But when they broke bread together at the table, they remembered, in their memories of their own personal experiences, in addition to their biblical tradition, their scriptural tradition, they remembered what he had said. And in remembering, they met him again. That is the power of memory. It's another reason we tell the story again and again, because this story is such a human story, this biblical story, not just today's story, but the entire scope of Scripture. It's a human story, and therefore it evokes our own stories. That's the power of memory. We read a Frederick Buechner short story in the adult Lenten study class this past Wednesday, which is extended beyond Easter because there are too many stories to fit into Lent. We got one more this Wednesday at 8 a.m. But Fred Buechner, the late uh, Presbyterian author and minister, wrote, maybe nothing is more important than we keep track, you and I, of these stories of who we are and where we come from and the people we have met along the way because it is precisely through these stories in all their particularity, as I have long believed and often said, that God makes himself known to us most powerfully and personally. The loved ones who are long gone, the relationships which have ended as life has taken you and the other person in a different direction, 
different stages of our lives, the good and the bad. Your life is scripture, the place where God makes God's self known to you. Do you see your life story that way? In our new member exploration classes, every time that people tell their journey, their story, they don't expect much to happen and the emotions just sort of start coming up and you can sort of see how powerful life's stories are. When I'm having trouble sleeping or coping, I say the prayer over and over again that my mother taught us as children. Jesus, tender shepherd, hear me. Bless thy lamb tonight. Through the darkness, keep thou near me. Keep me so till morning light. Amen. As a kid, I would say that really fast over and over, but I just keep doing it. A woman in Turin, Italy, writes of waking up in the middle of the night. A strong wind had been blowing for three days, shaking the pine trees, making them creak. This woman was in a period of her life when she felt overwhelmed by discontent and disillusionment. She felt like she was about to collapse and couldn't go on anymore. Then she did what she usually does. She covered her face with her hands and asked the Lord to be with her. And in her mind, she began to sing a hymn that she had learned more than 60 years earlier when she was a little girl. And the words of this old hymn comforted this Italian woman. They took her pain and her bitterness away. And in their place, she experienced and re-experienced joy and gratitude. You know, our faith is strengthened and deepened when we remember things we already know. And we look back again and remember the stories, the ups, the downs, the relationships. In these, we find the best of ourselves because somehow we see we've made it through in ways at the time we never thought we would. We find people, we find the people and the experiences uh, with which we have been blessed in ways that at the time we never, never could have orchestrated on our own. In other words, we find Jesus, the gift of God's self to us. The story ends with a meal. It's one of the reasons we celebrate the Lord's Supper in the Christian tradition, not only because of the Last Supper before Jesus was arrested and then eventually uh, crucified, but also because of the Emmaus story, this powerful image. They urge him to stay, it's getting late, getting dark. He makes like he's gonna walk on. He's gotta be polite. They say, no, no, stay with us. Come on, have, have, have something to eat with us at least. It's getting late. And in the, at the table, as he took a loaf of bread and blessed it and broke it, they recognized him. That's an amazing image, a sacramental image. It's one of the reasons that the Presbyterian tradition, our reformed Protestant tradition believes that Christ really is present in the meal, not because of any authority or words I say, but because of what's in your heart. That distinguishes us from Roman Catholic tradition, Episcopal, Lutheran, Methodist. For us, it's not the words and the authority, it is what's in your, it's the power of the spirit. But the presence of the living Christ is no less real for us in this moment because in the breaking of the bread we recognize him that act of hospitality that act of putting ourselves out for someone else so that's why we tell that story over and over again as well the biblical story our own story and in acts of hospitality and breaking bread together we recognize the risen Christ Barbara Brown Taylor uh, Episcopal priest and author and preacher extraordinaire wrote about the Emmaus story and about us. The blindness of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus does not keep their Christ from coming to them. He does not limit himself to those with full confidence in him. He comes to the disappointed, the doubtful, and the disconsolate. He comes to those who do not know their Bible, who do not recognize him even when they are walking right beside him. He comes to those who have given up and headed back home. Did you get the very end in our story today? It's late, it's dark, they've just walked seven miles, and what do those two guys do? They get back on the road and go right back to Jerusalem. They are transformed. They are filled with excitement and hope. 
Everything is fresh and new for them. Please pray with me. Loving God, we thank you for the good news of the gift of yourself, your love, your presence, your life, which cannot be contained, cannot be buried, cannot be held back. We're so grateful to participate in that gift each and every day of our lives as a church, as a community, in our home life, in everything we do. Continue, we pray, to inspire us and find us on the road. Amen. I'd like to invite the ushers forward for our morning offering. He walked beside me like he's been there all along. Not a stranger, but a father who can sense when something's wrong. And he answered all my questions. And he understood my fears That somehow vanished now That he was here Can you see who walks with me? Can you hear who speaks your name? Can you feel something stirring in your heart? How his words ring strong and true like the one familiar strain. Can the path we follow I couldn't hear for him to leave me, so I begged him, please, to stay. Spend the evening, a few moments, before he went away. Then, like a host, he stood and blessed me broke the bread and poured the wine. Then I knew there was something there I recognized. Yes, I can see who walks with me. I can hear who speaks my name. I can feel Something stirring in my heart. How his words ring strong and true, like the one familiar strain, and I know.
We're about to break bread together in the same tradition as those Emmaus Road disciples so many years ago with the risen Christ in our midst. Uh, if you are at home, now is the time to make sure you have your elements. Uh, we here in the sanctuary are going to, in a few minutes, upon the invitation and beginning with our ushers guiding us from the back pews forward, form a single line down the center aisle. And when you come up here, there will be a station with bread and with the cup. We invite you to take uh, the bread and cup and return by the side aisle to your seat. And you're welcome to uh, take your elements to eat and drink on your own time, after your own time of prayer and preparation, or uh, when I, always at the end, uh, get my vote, we can take them together as well. It's, it's up to you, whatever works best for you. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God who trust and expect to eat in the presence of the real spiritual presence of the risen Christ. It is such a joy and a privilege to do this, not because it's a routine or a ritual, but because in this moment, we meet and are met by the living God in the presence of the Christ who defeated all that would keep us from life, from abundant life, even the power of death. So we know that the words are true, and Jesus tells them to us by way of an invitation when he says, come to me, all you who are weary, as you walk along your road, and all of you who carry heavy burdens, for I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and humble at heart, and here you will find rest for your souls. Please join me in the responsive, uh, uh, you know what, for that, please join me in the communion hymn. We're going to stay seated and sing Communion Hymn 252, The Day of Arising.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks and praise to the Lord our God. Let's pray together. Loving God, it is our role in this relationship with you to be grateful, to live gratefully, to risk because you have loved us first. And we are so grateful, so reassured again and again when we meet you on the roadway as we walk, as we struggle, as we celebrate, as we live real lives. We're so grateful for the good news that the power that created the universe which has continued to create life over the centuries, is the same power which loves us intimately, knows us fully, and brings life-giving, life-inspiring, hope-securing presence. Your presence, your risen presence, is not only at work in our lives or the lives of this or any church, but all throughout this planet and in everyone's life. We ask, as we do for ourselves, that eyes are opened ears are opened, and hearts are open to sense your presence, and that in different ways, from different perspectives, in different languages, in different religions, philosophies, whatever it is, that your love be shown and expressed and made manifest so that hope might remain alive as well in places like Gaza and in the families of Israeli hostages in Ukraine in our own lives, in places devastated by fire or earthquake or violence, loneliness, homelessness, food insecurity, oh God, may the gift of the risen Christ bring hope and transformation again. We lift up especially those in our midst and in our lives who are in need of the reassurance of your living presence and infinite love today, the healing power which comes from that presence, the hope-giving power. We pray for Michelle. We pray for Gretchen. We pray for Blair. We pray for the continued gift of recovery, body, mind, and spirit for those we name now in silence. for Gary and for Peg, for Kathy. Hear our prayers, O oh God, as we bring before you in our hearts and minds your children everywhere. We pray for the family of Bill Schramm and David Haight, faithful servants now at home, fully in your embrace. And we ask that that same spirit of life and love now be poured out upon us this morning in this and onto these very everyday familiar elements of bread and juice, the fruit of the vine, that for us in faith and in trust in your love, these might be the broken body and poured out blood of our crucified and now risen Savior, even Jesus Christ, who teaches us when we gather always to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We know that on the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took a loaf of bread the same way he did on the night of that first Easter Sunday at those two disciples home in the village of Emmanuel. And in the same way, also after supper, we know he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, my blood which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink from it in remembrance of me. And we know from the Apostle Paul that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup together, we bear witness to God's infinite love and Christ's saving death until he should come again. Friends, the, peop- the gifts of God for the people of God, the table is set, all has been prepared. Come, again, following the usher's direction and beginning with the rear pews.
How beautiful the hands that served the wine and the bread and the children of earth. How beautiful the feet that walked the long dusty roads and the hills to the cross, how beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful is the body of Christ.
The bread we break, is it not the bread of heaven? And the cup we bless, is it not the cup of salvation? Please pray with me. Thank you for finding us, O God. Thank you for making yourself known to us, opening our eyes. We ask that you do it again and again. We can't do it alone. We're so grateful that we don't have to. Bless us. In the spirit of Easter, we pray always. And amen. Friends, you're able. Please stand as our closing hymn is number 240. Alleluia, alleluia. Give thanks. Friends, go into this day in peace and in joy, and as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious unto you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance always upon you. And as you go on your journey, as you walk along the road, may the Lord give you peace.